the Lords the topic which I propose to discuss. Certainly, it wasn't touched on in the gracious speech, but it could have been raised and should have been raised at any time. A very simple proposition, which may surprise the House. British weights and measures are in a mess. Litres for petrol and fizzy drinks, pints for beer and milk, metres and kilometres for athletics and the Ordnance Survey, miles per gallon for cars, the metric system for school, still pounds and ounces in the market. And certainly this muddle does matter. It increases costs, confuses shoppers, leads to serious misunderstandings, causes accidents, confuses our children's education, and quite bluntly puts us all to shame. It, it, it is even a constitutional topic, because about 800 years ago, Britain's first Charter of Human Rights dealt with constitutional matters. I'm referring, of course, to Magna Carta, Magna Carta, which proclaimed that there should be only one measure of wine throughout our whole realm, and one measure of corn, and one width of, cock, of cloth, and so on. And long before then, and ever since, every civilised society has recognised the need for one set, and only one set, of standard measures. By contrast with that, we have managed to come near to recreating the Israelis' two nations, divided between, on the one hand, a metrically literate elite and a rudderless and bewildered majority. So how did we get into this uniquely confusing shambles? Because we've been dithering about it for some 150 years. As long ago as 1862, a, a select committee of the House of Commons unanimously recommended the adoption of the metric system, which had swept across Europe and elsewhere. In 1904, the House of Lords voted in favour of a bill to the same effect. And, and remarkably, in a way, in 1965, the decision was finally taken in response to requests from the CBI and others, and after long and widespread consultation, to go metric over the following 10 years. It's important to understand that that decision had nothing to do with our relationship with our European partners because our own decision was taken eight years before we joined the European community, our own decision in our own case. So how did we manage to end up in this very British mess? It's because successive British governments have lacked consistently candour and courage in their implementation and presentation of a policy, which was at the outset rightly supported by a broad majority of all those who had given the topic serious consideration. It was the first Wilson government which launched the process in 1965, and the Heath, Wilson and Callaghan governments carried it on. The whole operation was handled without significant controversy by a broadly representative commission, the Metrication Board, which was, which was able in its final report in 1979 to suggest that the change was by then almost complete. In the Heath government, I had been, as Britain's first minister for consumer affairs, responsible for the metrication programme. But by 1979, I had myself become a penny-saving chancellor of the Exchequer. And as such, I readily accepted the decision to abolish the Metrication Board, which claimed to have completed the process. So, where should we go now? We simply cannot afford to go on crippling ourselves with acceptance of the present mess. And it certainly would be madness to go backwards. Nobody is now so foolish as to argue that we should actually move away from the rest of the world. The only solution is 
to complete the changeover to metric and as swiftly and cleanly as possible. To stay in our present imbroglio will continue, continue consumer confusion, perpetuate safety hazards, obstruct business efficiency. The fact is uh, that the most glaring omission I could have presented in this way, the most glaring omission from a gracious speech is the lack of any reference to the need to complete the modernization and metrication of course of our system of measurement. Measurement is fundamental to industrial production, to consumer protection, to health and safety, and to science and, ed and education. Uh, the policy of all governments since 1965 has formally been to change gradually from imposed metric units while continuing the option for consumers to continue using imperial measurements if they wish. But there has been no further progress of any kind since the year 2000 and metrication has got stuck. As a result, we remain in a muddle of metric and imperial measurements, with some people using one system <coughs> and others using the other, with all the resulting incomprehension, conversion errors, and additional costs, and giving the impression to visitors, especially in this Olympic year, that we are in a nation living in the imperial past. A particular recent concern, for example, is the failure of the Department of Transport to seize the opportunity to improve road safety by requiring all imperial only height and width restriction signs, which are perceived on all bridges over the highway, to be replaced by signs in dual metric and dual units. That would be a simple thing to do, about half a million pounds. If, if it was done, it would probably have huge financial benefits of over £2 million as a result of savings from reduced bridge strikes by foreign lorries, metric drivers on imperial roads with bewildering signs, with benefits of over £2 million as a result of savings from reduced British bridge strikes by foreign lawyers. I do urge the government as a whole and the country across the board to resume the long drawn out process of conversion to the metric system, begun in, 19, in 1965, we should seize opportunities for progress as they arise, and in particular make proper pre preparations for bringing us comprehensively up to modern international metric standards. A simple proposition, one that we've neglected for far too long, which we should courageously and carefully and swiftly undertake as soon as we can. My lords, can I thank the clerks and